Obama who told them, don't do it, Joe, you're going to lose. Now, that was according to the Times. Obama gently pressed Biden on his 2016 presidential ambitions over several weeks, and then he ultimately had a strategist deliver a discouraging assessment to Biden on the odds of being in the race against then frontrunner Hillary Clinton, and the president was not encouraging. Biden later said that, according to the Times, he believed that Clinton had the best chance to win, not creepy Uncle Joe. You know, Joe Biden has, I'm telling you, wait till we start vetting him. I don't want to do it too early. I don't want to peak too early in these things. I've already got my Joe Biden dossier that we're we're building right now. I was like, we're building one on everybody, considering it's a dossier. All it would be is called Google. You know, <laughs> if you want to be a dossier builder, go to Google. You don't have to go get the disinformation like Hillary did, you know, funnel money to a law firm and hire an op research group and get a foreign agent to talk about hookers urinating on the bed. This is not OK. Yeah, not OK. And uh, and it all turns out even The New York Times now saying it looks like that dossier thing might have been Russian intelligence. It might have been Russian disinformation. OK, uh, you mean Russian disinformation that was used as the basis of a FISA warrant on to spy on the Trump campaign on top of Stefan Halper spying on behalf of, you know, whoever in the Obama government. He's got all those issues. Then you got the issue, you know, partnering at the time with Jesse Helms on the issue of uh, busing and integration. He was against it in Delaware. And bragging his state's a slave state, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, we got to send a shout out today. I just uh, saw that Larry King had a heart attack and apparently went into a, hearty, a cardiac arrest. And apparently he's been having a difficult time breathing for a long time. He was scheduled to check himself into the hospital. And while he was at home getting ready to go to the hospital, he went into cardiac arrest. He was taken by ambulance to the hospital and uh, doctors performed an angioplasty, and uh, they opened up an artery that had collapsed and inserted several stents, and apparently the 85-year-old Larry King uh, was put in cardiac intensive care, and he's expected to be released on Monday, so we're hoping he's doing okay. I mean, he's had a, he's, he's been one of these guys that had heart attacks and then survived. I mean, modern medicine is incredible. We don't, we don't want to pay our doctors much anymore. So you're discouraging good, talented people from ever getting into medicine. What do you mean? My doctor down the block, he drives a Mercedes. Okay, he's probably 60 because by the time a doctor does college and medical school and residency and internship and then maybe works at a hospital a couple of years and then wants to pay all that money back, all those student loans back. But I guess Elizabeth Warren's going to handle that with her wealth tax. Maybe, maybe they should. You take away all the student loans of doctors, you'll be doing fine. Um, anyway, new Washington Post ABC poll shows uh, Biden in a free fall already and is, you know, jumping into the race. Pop has died. He had 27 percent of Democrats in his corner. Uh, Bernie Sanders had 20 and uh, morning consult released the same day. Biden had 30. Anyway, a Hill survey released on April 6th showed that Biden's share was uh, surging at 36 percent. He's lost nine points. No specific candidate in the crowded Democratic field commanded a major lead, although Biden led the pack at 13. 13? For a former vice president? That's a disaster. Um, anyway, so it seems like that whole Biden fantasy might be coming apart faster than we thought. Um, I want to just turn our attention to this, the, the media and their coverage and the New York Times because it's so despicable, and the, the way they've handled this and their explanation of this is just a lie. And how do you know? Because you can just see it for what it is. Now, we had this terrible shooting that took place out in the synagogue in California over the weekend, and I have a montage. How is it possible that a shooter that has a manifesto that reveals that he's a racist that he's anti-Semitic and a Trump hater. That's what we've discovered. It didn't take us long to discover this either. You know, we we discovered this fairly quickly.
By the way, the woman that rushed in front of the rabbi and saved his life, there's only one person killed. This woman that protected and saved the rabbi. An unbelievable story. And uh, we're praying for her and her family. I mean, it was so sad to see, you know, see this all unfold here. But the sole fatality in, in the San Diego area synagogue shooting was the mother and wife heroically. Uh, where do these people come from in life sometimes? You don't you know, wife and mother. She sees what's happening. Uh, it's an old, older man, a rabbi. I saw him on TV. My heart was bleeding for him. He's just you know, so shaken by everything that had happened. He, she just leaps in front of the rabbi to save his life. Wow. You know, there is a phrase in the Bible, no greater love has anyone to lay down their life for another. I mean, just so heroic. She had been at the uh, synagogue to pray for her late mother when this anti-Semitic gunman, Trump hater, identified as 19-year-old John Ernest, burst in and began spraying the lobby with assault rifle bullets, and a woman threw herself between Ernest and Goldstein, and originally from, happens to be from Brooklyn, New York, and Crown Heights. And uh, anyway, a tragic turn. Gilbert Kay's husband, a doctor, rushed over to perform CPR. He didn't even realize it was his own wife that he was performing CPR on as she lay dying. Can you imagine that? And giving her emergency treatment, he then realizes the woman is his wife, and the shock caused him to faint. It's unbelievable. He's now then laying on the floor next to his wife, and the daughter comes out screaming. Quote, it was the most heart-wrenching I, I, thing I've sight I have ever seen. Lori took the bullet for all of us. She didn't deserve to die. She was the kindest person I have ever known and the community's ever known. We're in such shock. You know, I, I know when we like to think about, well, how would we act in moments like that? Would you be, just think in your own head, would you be the person that jumped in front of the bullet? I mean, I don't know. I mean, was, you can think in your mind you're going to do a thousand things. It's like you can think about, uh, you know, I, I do fighting and training. Okay, I can think a thousand different ways. I'm going into battle. We we spar often at the uh, dojo that I go to. I can think a thousand different things that might happen, but then you have to deal with what the reality is. And then you hope that your training kicks in. That's the whole point of training. And the media, what do they do? They blame Donald Trump, of course. Listen. This is an epidemic, and we have a president who will not, who not only will not acknowledge that we have an epidemic of white nationalist terror after New Zealand said just a few people, he's providing the mood music for it. That is the reality we face. Yeah, I think the president needs to at some point look in the mirror and you understand that the rhetoric, the words he uses in all of this, inflame this big part of what's going on in America, give permission to the most craziest people in America. And it happens in part because there's a climate set at the top of unbelievable, constant lies and hostility and, and division in this country, not only as policy, but has with his affect. The conspiracy theories cited by these neo-Nazis in Pittsburgh and New Zealand and now outside San Diego, conspiracy theory that Trump never condemned and actually uh, seemed to support. And we don't know if it has any connection to um, to the politics that's going on. But I mean, it would be a stretch to, to say that it doesn't. Somebody that's anti-immigrant in California, the anti-immigrant hate and refugees going on in the country, what happened at the Tree of Life, and then you couple that with the president's language, it's a big problem. Donald Trump and all of this hate, right, is part of the environment of today, and he, he bears some responsibility for it. We can't deny it. I mean, the, the level of hateful rhetoric that's out there, and that it's not enough to be someone's opponent intellectually, but they're scum and you have to destroy them. That fills the air. Look, we've always been a violent society. America's history is founded on violence. But the underbelly was generally tamped down. We got some of it with McCarthy. We got some of it with George Wallace. But this era we're in with Donald Trump, it's like the gates of hell have been opened and but these people get a pass on to come on out 
and do it in public. But we know but what's yeah. difficult is that, yes, we're having this conversation right here Sunday morning, but unfortunately, the leader of the free world doesn't want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think when the president, you know, the most visible person representing this country, does not feel the urgency of this question and how to understand this. I mean, the commission you're talking about, you think Donald Trump is going to start that? I mean, absolutely, absolutely not. not. <laughs> but that's what but that's what a leader should be doing in these moments. And we just don't hear anything from him about it. How does so many quickly rush to judgment? Alan Dershowitz had a great line. He's actually linking the anti-Semitic New York Times cartoon to the synagogue shooting by saying uh, the distance between the offices of the New York Times International Edition and the synagogue in San Diego, which a gunman attacked on Saturday, is growing smaller as the reach of the Internet is growing larger. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'll get to that when we get back. Why don't I tell you about this cartoon and much, much more? Hey, listen, everybody, look, Mother's Day is coming. You think of all the things mom did for you in your life. You think of if you're up or down or in between, mom's there to pick up the pieces. Mom's there to be your biggest fan, the biggest support. Think of all the dinners she cooked, all the work she did every single day to make your life better. 1-800-Flowers. Don't settle for anything less. 1-800-Flowers.com. They're offering right now for Mother's Day, their exclusive 30 for 30 offer. And by the way, this is for all the moms in your life. Uh, maybe your wife, maybe your mother-in-law, grandma. Don't forget grandma, your sisters. All right. Have the kids pick up some, pick out some of these flowers. They're beautiful mix. Yellow, pink, blooms, 30 assorted tulips, 30 bucks. And with 1-800-Flowers, they always pick these tulips at their peak from Premier Farms, and they ship them overnight to ensure freshness. You pick the delivery date, but this is the best deal you're ever going to get, and it ends Wednesday. 30 assorted tulips, 30 bucks. Just go to 1-800-Flowers.com, click on the radio icon, enter the code, radio code Hannity. That's 1-800-Flowers.com, radio code Hannity. You're going to save today, and you're going to be taking care of all the moms in your life because they deserve it. And you're a good person. The radio show the mainstream media loves to hate. This is the Sean Hannity Show. So we had this terrible attack on this uh, synagogue in near San Diego over the weekend. And sure enough, you have this hero, Lori Gilbert K. And I just played all the everybody on cable news. The very same people that have been lying and wrong and pushing conspiracy theories for two and a half years. And what did I say? I, they're never going to learn their lesson. They're never going to stop. And. Their rage and hatred of Donald Trump and anybody that likes Don Donald Trump has now crossed over into a level of psychosis I don't think anybody ever imagined is possible. Uh, so what did the New York Times do? Well, they finally ended up apologizing. But it took a long time to get. Why did it take so long to get there? That's the question that I have. Because they ran this cartoon on Thursday showing a blind President Trump wearing a skull cap meaning i assume that's meant to be a yarmulke but you see how they you see how they put that on there it looks like it, 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 it basically these are all anti-semitic everything about it is anti-semitic even the new york times finally but they did this thursday he's being led around by the israeli prime minister bibi netanyahu they portrayed the prime minister of Israel with the Star of David around his neck as a dog. And there's a leash and collar on Netanyahu's dog character in the cartoon uh, with the Star of David on it. I mean, it, you could take it right out of, like, former Nazi propaganda crap. And anyway, the political cartoon is in the international print edition. Even they, well, I'll explain what they, how long, why did it take so long to get that? Why was it Saturday and not Thursday? And why was it blamed on only one guy when everybody in the newspaper has a responsibility to check that out? And then why didn't you apologize and say you're sorry on day one? We'll get to all that next. You won't hear 
hear the mainstream press talking about this stuff, Sean Hannity is on the radio. All right, so on Thursday, they I mean, this cartoon in the New York Times International Edition uses every single cliched, stereotypical, age-old uh, caricature descriptions Anybody that wa- that was anti-Semitic, that, that's what they did here. You know, just, it, I mean, it was so obvious and so, it, there was no ambiguity about what this is. None whatsoever. So it shows up in the Times report on Thursday, these anti-Semitic tropes, Prime Minister, as a guide dog, star of David, collar leading the president, you know, it's uh, obviously, I, I read it too, to trying to diminish the, the true nature of a yarmulke and its holy significance and the Jewish faith. The initial editors note, finally on Saturday, they say something. They say, well, the image was offensive, an error of judgment to publish it. It was provided by a, to the New York Times uh, service and syndicate. Well, but they deleted it. This is Saturday. It's happened on Thursday and saying it's an error of judgment. They didn't say they didn't apologize for this. They didn't acknowledge what this was. You know, we just heard this horrible synagogue shooting. And what did we hear? The same idiots who've been lying for two, two and a half years, the same idiots that were out there bludgeoning a 16 year old kid for wearing a MAGA hat. The same idiots that were advancing every bizarre conspiracy under the the face of the sun. I mean, we have a BuzzFeed reporter where they initially printed the dossier, finally saying that the dossier is an effed up document. Well, took a while. Anyway, so they first retract it on Saturday. This went out on Thursday with the but they they never had an apology involved in any way, shape, matter, or form, which clearly means they didn't get it. They didn't fully understand it. And what's so offensive about that part of it is all you have to do is look at it. It should be a no-brainer, as they say. And um, it's hard to imagine what took them so long to even finally go further. But then by Sunday, Thursday, late all day Thursday, Friday, Saturday, now we're in Sunday. They decided to give another shot, and um, they finally apologized for their actions, announced an internal review and significant changes to its editorial process in the in the future. We are deeply sorry for the publication of anti-Semitic political cartoon last Thursday in the print edition of the New York Times that circulates outside the U.S., and we are committed to making sure nothing like this happens again. And it says such imagery is always dangerous. And at a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise worldwide. Yeah, that's that's a big problem. Huge problem. We have investigated how this happened and learned that because it's unacceptable and because of the faulty process of a single editor. Oh, we're going to blame it that we're going to bring it down to one single editor. No one else saw this in the New York Times. I don't believe that for Five seconds. Really? They're just dumping it on one person. They're thinking, well, we'll just fight, blame one person. Anyway, it goes on to say, without adequate oversight, downloaded the, syndica- the syndicated cartoon, made the decision to include it in the opinion page. The matter remains under review. We are evaluating our internal processes, uh, processes and training, et cetera, et cetera. We anticipate significant changes. Times has still not identified the single editor. It's just unbelievable. And we have this horrible shooting that took place. Alan Dershowitz, he made these comments. Uh, He said, one of the weapons of hate against Jews deployed by Nazi Germany were cartoons and caricatures that depicted Jews as subhuman animals, often as dogs and spiders. You remember I used to quote Mohammed Morsi? Backed by the Obama administration, the guy, the Muslim Brotherhood, former head, had once referred to Jews as descendants of apes and pigs. 
Okay, this is what I keep saying. This is stereotypical. This is classic. This is it is the age old caricature descriptions in both cases. And then Obama ended up giving the guy that referred to Jews as descendants of apes and pigs. Nobody paid attention but me seemingly in the media. And what did he get? Billions of dollars from Obama and military support, etc. Anyway, so he goes on to say about how one of the weapons deployed the hate against Jews in Nazi Germany, cartoons and caricatures depicting Jews as subhuman animals, often as dogs or spiders. So when the New York Times International Edition published a cartoon over the weekend portraying the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, as a dog wearing a Star of David, its editors should have should not have been surprised at the outrage reaction and the controversy in Europe and in Berkeley. Increasing anti-Semitism is deemed acceptable by many on the left as long as it's directed at the nation state of the Jewish people and its leaders and defenders. Israel today has increasingly become the object of historic anti-Jewish stereotyping. He's right. And I'm going to tell you, it's it's rise is chilling. There was an article a couple of weeks ago. And now because of anti-Semitism, many Jewish people are leaving Europe and moving to Israel. By the way, that is their ancestral homeland. By the way, and all these people in the media blaming Trump, there's never been a president that has had a better relationship and done more to stand up for the state of Israel then President Donald Trump, all these presidents that promised they'd move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, they made the promise, a campaign promise, they never did it. person to do it is the person that keeps his word, Donald Trump. And then recognizing the Golan Heights as Israeli territory, which it is. And I think that certainly shows the, the nature and the the love and commitment to our closest ally in the region. Dershowitz is right. Europe and Berkeley, it's, ha- it's, it's, ha- look at Congresswoman Omar. He says the distance between the offices of the New York Times International Edition and the synagogue in San Diego, which a gunman attacked on Saturday, is growing smaller as the reach of the internet is growing larger, both the extreme right and Extreme left dehumanized Jews, and it's far easier to kill a dehumanized stereotype than a real person. He's talking about these, these Nazis. They hate Christ, they, they hate Catholics. They hate everybody. So I guess except themselves. And how ignorant they are. You got Omar. He said, consider these anti-Semitic remarks of Congresswoman Omar, Minnesota, or Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan. And then goes on to say, South African Bishop, Bishop Desmond Tutu, he mentioned. British Labor Party leader Jeremy Corbyn. Many liberals have defended them. Bernie Sanders of Vermont, who was among the worst defenders, actually went to London to show support for his fellow socialist Corbyn, despite the history of anti-Semitism he has. His tolerance for anti-Semitism from the left is the most pronounced at universities where our future leaders are studying. For that reason, hard left tolerance of anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Zionism is our future unless we can stop it. He's not wrong. Sadly, he's not wrong. And the people that rush to judgment to try to blame Trump for this horrific shooting that took place. I mean, it's like they have no shame at all. Considering the history of Trump. And to relate, and I've known how many we've known, we knew, we've been really good friends with Prime Minister Netanyahu for over 20 some odd years of my life. I mean, really close friends. Um, somebody I, I think stood on the, the world stage as the only voice of moral clarity until Trump got elected. That's Do you what, remember how you guys met? No, <laughs> I don't. How? So the Prime Minister actually told the story when we went to Israel of how he met you. And it's it's actually pretty incredible. What was it? He heard you on the radio. He heard you on the radio. He heard you talking about Israel. Or he heard you talking about, you know, all of all of the things that were so misunderstood by so many 
in America and didn't truly understand what was happening on the West Bank, Gaza Strip, you know, between the Palestinians and the, and those Jewish people who choose to live in the kibbutzes right there on the bank. Well, we were in the kibbutz. Um, remember the night before it got hit with a rocket. The, it's on the, the border with Gaza. I won't say it right. You will. Salot. Sterot. Sterot. Sorry. Uh, and we saw the, they, they put in glass, BBs, metal, to, to maximize anything, yeah. maximize and, human damage. Well, I think the sadder part about that particular incident that you're talking about and that bombing is that those those particular kibbutzes are for teaching children, and that's where they were having a summer camp. Well, remember, they can't have a... It's so close to the Gaza border, they can't put playgrounds outside. They have underground play, playgrounds that are basically bunkers. And if it wasn't for the Iron Dome, I, you know, Israel would be in, would be hit left and right every hour of every day. It never stop. And then yeah, we, that's how the prime minister met you, which is very funny. He heard you on the radio, and then he called a mutual friend of ours, and he's like, you got to find this guy, this uh-huh. Hannity guy. He's an Irish guy yeah, talking this, about Israel and how much he loves Israel. And I just thought it was – it's just so funny. Israel funny is the only democracy in the region. And they, and we how deep was that tunnel we went in? It had to be 50, 100 feet below ground. And remember I went back to help that reporter, print reporter, because she couldn't get back up, and she was a big liberal – she goes, I don't even like you. Well, I didn't like you until now. It was pretty funny. Funny she did, what happens when you're so, in a tunnel. It was so steep to climb back up. And by the way, the tunnels that they would build were used. They were using Israeli cement and Israeli electricity that was and supposed funding. to be used for funding. That was supposed to be exactly used for water. But they use it to build these elaborate tunnels. That was when we were there in the last war. Then I did. A, I went back another time to Israel and I flew from Tel Aviv up the coast. To show how small this country is in a helicopter. Nobody understands the security risks that they have. But I mean, you know, it's all of this. And even in the U.S. Congress now, they can't condemn, you know, virulent anti-Semitism. And all these people in the media all weekend long blaming Trump. I I couldn't believe when you guys played me this montage. I was trying to shut down. I didn't want to hear it this weekend. And I was obviously I saw some of the coverage, but not I don't watch fake news that much. And then when I heard it, I couldn't believe it. Now, the BuzzFeed reporter is saying his name is uh, Anthony Cormier. I guess he's part of this investigative team that they have over at BuzzFeed. And he says that uh, but he wasn't a part of the story about the dossier. And BuzzFeed editor Ben Smith made the decision to post the 35 page unverified dossier during Trump's transition which uh, the dossier is compiled. Now the New York Times is telling us it was Russian disinformation. Imagine that. Took all this time to figure that out. And the media goes that deep into conspiracy theories, and they won't let it go. They're not saying that they were wrong. No, they just, now they move their hope first from the FBI. You know, then we had a House Intel investigation. Then we had a bipartisan Senate investigation, and, you can't get any more clear with what Robert Mueller says. Now they're putting their faith and hope on Congress to do it. They're just, they're never going to stop. And, you know, by the way, there was a story, I think, on Gateway Pundit today about how Joe Biden may have discussed the Steele dossier in a secret Oval Office meeting with the coup plotters before the Trump. All this is headed right into the Oval Office, I think, of the Obama administration by the time we're all done. Rod Rosenstein revealed a lot of damaging information about the Obama administration's handling of the Russian probe. And, um, you know, he's he castigated, by the way, the Obama administration for not being honest with the American people about the scope of Russian interference, scolding the FBI and Congress, including Comey for selectively leaking classified information, which is a crime. Some critical decisions about the Russia investigation were made before I got there. The previous administration chose not to publish the full story about the Russian computer hackers. This all happened on their watch. You know, the bulk of uh, information in the FISA warrants to spy on the Trump campaign. Yeah, that all happened on Biden Obama's watch. A confirmation hearing, he said a Republican senator asked me to make a commitment you're going to be in charge of the Russia Rush investigation. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me you'll do it right. You'll take it to its conclusion. And the report, the American people will see. All right. And he feels 
He's the one that said, nope, no obstruction. I don't particularly think Rod Rosenstein is a friend of Donald Trump. There's so much coming out, it's going to be unbelievable. And now they want Barr to testify. You know, constitutionally, Congress has oversight powers, not their lawyers. And now they're saying that, no, 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 if Barr comes to testify, we're going to let our lawyers go at you because they're too dumb to figure it out themselves. Why don't you have your lawyers write the questions for you if you're too stupid to do it yourself? Anyway, 800-941-SHAWN is our toll-free telephone number. Newt Gingrich is coming in. We might get some calls in. He says he's going to stick around today. Anyway, I thought some prayers were with Larry King. Apparently, I think everything went okay with his surgery. He apparently had some a heart attack, cardiac arrest. And from what I hear, he's going to be fine. Maybe release Monday. Hey, listen, what if I told you uh, that you can get the gun of your dreams? Uh, maybe you don't buy the media hype about what an AR-15 is. Yeah, it actually happens to be a great rifle. I own a number of them myself. Yeah, they're going to give you 10 free chances to win from the USCCA. And, of course, they provide education, training, trusted legal protection if you are a responsibly armed American that believes in your Second Amendment rights. This offer ends May 24th. Text the word GUNS, G-U-N-S, to 87222. Lock in your entry. 10 free chances to win. And as an extra bonus, they'll also send you a concealed carry guide uh, just for entering. You need to know this information if you're going to be responsible. Now, they're on a mission at the USCCA to help responsibly armed Americans protect their families. And they also love giving away free guns. So don't miss your chance to win one of 10 AR-15s if you text the word GUNS, G-U-N-S, to 87222. 87222. Text the word GUNS. John Hannity. Every single congressional district in my state, including Michelle Bachman's. Okay? That's when you guys are supposed to cheer, okay? This is a moment in our history. As I say, it's not about politics, it's about patriotism. It's an existential threat, this administration, to our democracy in terms of our Constitution. If you look at drain the swamp, I am draining the swamp. Thank you very much. Freedom is back in style. Welcome. To the revolution. Yeah, we're coming to your city. Gonna play our guitars and sing you a country song. Sean Hannity. The new, the new Sean Hannity Show. More behind-the-scenes information on breaking news. And more bold, inspired solutions for America. Uh, but Mr. Clapper then went on to say that, to his knowledge, there was no evidence of collusion between members of the Trump campaign and the Russians. We did not conclude any evidence in our report. And when I say our report, that is the NSA, FBI, and CIA, with my office, the Director of National Intelligence, that had anything, any reflection of collusion between the members of Trump campaign and the Russians. There was no evidence of that in our report. Was Mr. Clapper wrong when he said that? I think he's right uh, about characterizing the report, which you, you all have read. We did not include any evidence in our report, and I say our, that's NSA, FBI, and CIA with my office, the Director of National Intelligence, that had anything, that had any reflection of collusion between members of the Trump campaign and the Russians. There was no evidence of that included in, in our report. Have you seen anything either intelligence briefings, through intelligence briefings, anything to back up any of the accusations that sure. you've made. They have the documentation that they did the hacking. The hacking. On the DNC. Right. And on some of us, you know, that had... But the collusion, there. though. No, we have not. Do you have evidence that there was, in fact, collusion between Trump associates and Russia during the campaign? Not at this time. Have you seen anything that suggests any collusion between the Russians and the Trump campaign? Well, there's an awful lot of smoke there, let's put it that way. People that might have said they were involved, to what extent they were involved, to what extent the president might have known about these people or whatever. There's nothing there from that standpoint that we have seen directly linking uh, our president to any of that. Did evidence exist 
of collusion, coordination, conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russian state actors at the time you learned of 2016 efforts? I don't know whether or not such collusion, that's your term, such collusion existed. I don't know. The big questions, of course, is, is there any evidence of collusion you have seen yet? Is there? There is a lot of smoke. We have no smoking gun at this point, but there is a lot of smoke. Diane Feinstein has said there's no evidence of collusion. So collusion between whom? Can you tell us that? I'm not prepared to say that there's proof you could take to a jury, but I can say that there is enough that we ought to be investigating. At the time you separated from service in January of 2017, had you seen any evidence that uh, Donald Trump or any member of his campaign colluded, conspired, or coordinated with the Russians or anyone else uh, to infiltrate or impact our uh, voter infrastructure? Um, not beyond uh, what has been out there open source and not beyond anything that I'm sure this committee has already seen and heard before directly from the intelligence community. Finally, the special counsel investigated a number of links or contacts between the Trump campaign officials and individuals connected with the Russian government during the 2016 presidential campaign. After reviewing these contacts, the special counsel did not find any conspiracy to violate U.S. law involving Russian-linked persons and any persons associated with the Trump campaign. So that's the bottom line. The way we operate in the Department of Justice, if we can accuse somebody of wrongdoing, we have to have admissible evidence and credible witnesses. We need to prepare to prove our case in court. And we have to affix our signature to the charging document. That's something that not everybody appreciates. Uh, there's a lot of talk about FISA applications. And many people that I, I see talking about it seem not to recognize uh, what a FISA application. A FISA application is actually a warrant, just like a search warrant. Uh, in order to get a FISA uh, search warrant, you need an affidavit signed by a career federal law enforcement officer who swears that the information in the affidavit is true and correct to the best of his knowledge and belief. Uh, and that's the way we operate. And if it's wrong, sometimes it is, if you find out there's anything incorrect in there, that person is going to face consequences. All right, hour two, Sean Hannity Show, right down our toll-free telephone number. So you, you just heard right there everything that this country has been through uh between an author we're going to have in, in the next hour who may not be known to you who writes about as a liberal the incredible delusional temper tantrum insanity of of so many on the left you know leading to two and a half years of non-stop investigation even though we have a president that has kept more promises accomplished more things for more Americans than any president really in modern history, none of that seems to matter. You know, but we go through two and a half years. We have four separate investigations now into this whole notion, this idea that there was collusion between the Russians and the Trump campaign. Uh, then we find out well, a lot more in the process. It never happened. That was the FBI nine month investigation. How do we know? Because of the closed door testimony recently released, Struck and Page said, huh, we didn't have anything when we handed it over to Mueller. Nothing. And then they also said that Hillary's investigation was rigged. Now the New York Times is saying that Hillary's bought and paid for dossier that was used as the foundation for the FISA warrants. Yeah, that was likely Russian disinformation that she ended up paying for. And they all fell hook, line, and sinker because of this psychosis, this rage that seems to be taking over the left. And uh, it's actually a theme. Uh, we welcome back to the studio uh, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, number one best-selling author. But he has his new book out, a novel called Collusion, ripped from today's headlines. If, I, if you don't mind me <laughs> stealing a cliche, uh, it really is. Could you ever think we'd go through this for two and a half years? No. No, but particularly, I keep asking the question, when did Mueller know that it wasn't true? And why did he sit on it? I mean, here he's letting the President of the United States weakening the whole country by allowing the whole world to believe there's, a, there's something there. And my guess is he may have known a year ago that there was nothing there. And it's, it's then really why, a then disservice. Why did, then why did he do it? So we can get people on taxi medallions, uh uh, look, everyone should pay their taxes. You can't lie on loan applications. That was pretty much Manafort and Cohn. But but I say I think what happened was they had they brought in all of these very expensive, hardline Democrats, 
and they just couldn't let it go. I mean, they kept thinking, surely we'll find something. And they didn't. And I, I think, you know, I, I try to remind people when you go back to the Clinton period that Ken Starr's report said Clinton was guilty on 11 counts. Now, can you imagine where we'd be right now if Mueller had come in and said Trump was guilty on 11 counts? Instead, he comes in and says there's nothing there. And even when there's nothing there, the Democrats can't let it up, which is why you have this absurdity today uh, with Nadler saying, I don't just want to have the attorney general come up here. I want to have our lawyers ask him questions. Now, there's no constitutional right for lawyers to get involved. That's not congressional oversight. That's congressional lawyers oversight. That's right. Well, and it's also clearly just pure partisan attacks. Well, I don't listen. The White House has said the president reiterated again in an interview that I had with him Thursday night. No, we've cooperated. This president never once invoked executive privilege. He even allowed the White House counsel 30 hours before Robert right. Mueller's uh, special counsel. Not one. One point five million documents. told everybody in the White House, go talk to Mueller for as long as he needs you. Um, The fact, and then they they, they say clearly no collusion with Russia whatsoever. And then Mueller writes this cute little 200-page political document. Well, we didn't want to make a decision on it, but there was no underlying crime, and the president was pretty vocal about wanting to fire, maybe I should fire Mueller or Rod Rosenstein, but he didn't do it, did he? Right. Just because he thought about it. Well, and, that, and that's why I think that what, what you have, I mean, when I, when I look in the eyes of some of my liberal friends, they hate Trump so deeply, they can't let it up. They hate you and me so deeply because we like them. But not as much as they hate Trump. <laughs> no, it, it, doesn't, <laughs> it, doesn't rise, it doesn't rise to that level. No. So what happens with, now we'll get Congress... It seems like they're hell bent, although there is a side of them that is amazingly torn. I was watching uh, Adam the Cowardly Schiff Lion uh, on TV this weekend, and he's worried. He's like, well, I don't know if we should impeach him. The public approval rating for impeachment is lower than it's ever been right now. Nobody, right. because everyone accepts the Mueller report as the definitive statement on this. So they're not sure what they should do. But I think the hardcore of that party is going to win out because that. Well, but they got to look, they have a huge problem. First of all, I don't think they could pass impeachment in the House because there are enough Democrats from Trump districts that are going to go, wait a second, you want me to commit suicide? I mean, this is the kind of issue where you it's bye bye. Uh, second, you know, there's zero possibility in the Senate that they would convict. Zero. How does this play out politically for them? Because Nadler, Schiff, uh, Maxine Waters are all saying, okay, you're saying you're not going to come. We're going to hold you in contempt of Congress. Then it'll be fought in the courts. Obviously, that's people within the White House. What about all these people that already spent a fortune on lawyers that testified right. already? You're going to drag them back to congressional well, committees? That's, that's what I think should be one of the real scandals of this thing. I mean, Mueller interviewed, I think, 500 people. Every one of them had to go out and get uh, so you know. A lawyer. I'll give you the numbers: six hundred and seventy-four days, twenty-five plus million dollars, forty FBI agents, intelligence analysts, forensic accountants, and other professional staff, nineteen attorneys, twenty-eight hundred subpoenas, five hundred search warrants, two hundred and thirty orders for communication records, five hundred witnesses, and thirteen requests to foreign governments for evidence. So. People ought to, ought to actually look at the total cost of the Mueller investigation. The innocent person out there who had to take time, who had to hire a lawyer. I have a friend who spent a million two hundred thousand dollars, who wasn't even engaged. I mean, it had he had nothing to do with it, and it was at a million two. So you can't imagine times five hundred witnesses. Uh, there may have been a half billion dollars or more spent just on the lawyer side. The thing that I think that's hard for people to understand is that, and this is, I have a hard time understanding such a transparent double standard. Hillary Clinton did have a private email server. She did send out a letter to all State Department employees saying, you're not allowed to put work material on any of your private devices. She had a private server in a mom and pop shop bathroom closet. We're pretty sure about six at least foreign Intel agencies hacked into it. 
they probably have the 33,000 emails. And then when the the issue came up, they acid washed the hard drive. They deleted 33,000 subpoenaed e- emails. We never he- heard of Bleach Bit before this. Now everybody knows. They busted up the devices and they removed the SIM cards. So here's the point. An underlying crime, the Espionage Act, and a real intent by destroying the evidence with all of those steps that they made to get rid of them all. Well, look, I, I, th- I think you have to start with the idea. You have two competing universes here. This is why this is so difficult and so bitter. In the Democratic Party's universe, Hillary was totally innocent and Donald Trump is guilty. In our universe, the overwhelming weight of evidence is that Hillary actually was guilty and that we now have Mueller who has said that Trump was innocent. And I think if you thought of it as as a fight between two universes, you'll understand better how deep the divide is and why the other side keeps inventing things. Well, I mean, does it play out in 2020? Is this, do oh, they, absolutely. Look, do, you, do you think it's going to be I, huge? I, I, well, I watched um, Joe Biden on The View Friday, yeah, huh? and it was fascinating. Uh, the left has to create a series of lies in order to survive. So the, they go. Th- that's why for a while they were so excited by Mueller, because he was going to prove their lie was true. Now he has proven their lie wasn't true, and they're really befuddled about what to do next. Now, I'll give you an example, because this really hit me doing some research Friday afternoon. All right, hold that thought. I'm going to get both of us a, a cup of Black Rifle coffee. I don't know if you've Great. had it yet. So you drink coffee every day, sure, right? Of course. Okay, how, how do you like your coffee? I usually just drink it black. I like black coffee also. All right, so you've tried all those big liberal names. We all know what they are. You've been in one of those fancy, you know, people on the computers talking, you know, whatever, uh, coffee shops. By the way, Starbucks has now added 25 stores that are now have uh, syringe disposals within the bathrooms. Isn't that nice of them? Taking care of their base, I guess. Anyway, so there were a bunch of vets, in, you know, serving in Afghanistan right. and Iraq. All right. So they didn't like government coffee. I don't blame them. I'm sure it was horrible, like an MRE. So they started importing. While they're away, they would order beans from all over the world. And they started building their own blends of coffee. And they came up with Black Rifle Coffee, which is now my favorite, blackriflecoffee.com slash Sean. You go there. Here's the thing. It is the single best roast-to-order coffee you've ever had in your life. If I start my day, every other coffee you've ever tried, I promise you, and I'll send some to you. I can. You're not in the government. Every other coffee you've ever tried is, you like, oh, tastes like oh, sour water. It just, this is the best coffee I ever had. Now, they built BlackRifleCoffee.com. They only hire vets and first responders. It was a company founded by them. They donate to them, and you join their coffee club, and they deliver it to your house, and you're supporting a company that gives back to heroes of America. And you know what? Their website's the funniest one I've ever seen. Once you try BlackRifleCoffee.com slash Sean, once you try it, you'll never go back because it's that good and it's that different. And they have all the different varieties and brands that I'm sure one will fit the taste that you have. Uh, and if you order now, BlackRifleCoffee.com slash Sean, you're going to get 20% off. And again, they donate to first responder and veteran causes uh, with part of every sale. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash Sean. We'll continue. While the mainstream media is asleep at the wheel, Hannity Watch is on the job, bringing you the news no one else can. Sean Hannity. Uh, Are you sorry for what you did? Are you prepared to apologize to those women? Look, here's the deal. I have to be, and everybody has to be, much more aware of the private space of men and women. It's not just women, but primarily women. And, uh, And I am much more cognizant of that. But I am so, like, for example, uh, I actually thought in my head when I walked out here, I mean, do I, I know, it's, we're friends, it's tricky. no, I, but, but, but I have to be aware of it. So I have to, 
I have to be more cognizant. We all have to be more. A woman or a man has a right to say, particularly a woman, say, no, this is not my space. They don't, shouldn't have to say no. I should be able to read better. Anyway, I, I think it's legitimate, and I think it is, uh, and to, to, and to, and to anyone, I, but I don't think anyone's ever said that I invaded their space in a way that was designed to do something uh, other than making them feel uncomfortable, but not any thing having to do with harassment or anything else. Right, they have said. You didn't vote for Clarence Thomas, right? Not only did I vote for Clarence Thomas, I believed her from the beginning. Yeah. I was against Clarence Thomas. I did everything in my power right. to defeat Clarence Thomas. And he's won by the smallest margin anyone ever won going on the Supreme Court. But she, she was not 100% happy with your discussion with her. So here's your opportunity right now to just say you you apologize, you're sorry. I think we can clean this up right now. Well, by the way, I, I did. I understand the... Uh, Look, I'm not going to judge whether or not it was appropriate, what she had, whether she thought it was sufficient, but I said privately what I've said publicly. I am sorry she was treated the way she was treated. I wish we could have figured out a better way to get this thing done. I did everything in my power to do what I thought was within the rules to be able to stop things. As they say in my business, I'm going to... I'm going to give you the whole load today. We got the first sort of mainstream African American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice looking guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's a storybook. You're telling me we got to go spend money to keep from going bankrupt? Yes, you don't know my state. My state was a slave state. My state is a border state. My state is the eighth largest black population in the country. My state is anything from a northeast liberal state. Now, I'm like the token black or the token woman. I was the token young person. All right, there it is. Crazy, creepy Uncle Joe. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't apologize for inappropriate touching. I have a crazy, more... creepy Uncle Joe. I haven't been more cognizant. And I'm sorry Anita Hill was treated the way she was treated. Well, Anita Hill did not accept that apology. Newt Gingrich is in studio with us. He's got a new book out just uh, this week. It's called Collusion, ripped right out of the headlines of today. And if you live in the New York, New Jersey area, he will be at bookends tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Um, crazy, creepy Uncle Joe. I, I have to tell you, this was to me a real revelation. It shouldn't have been after all this is, but it was. So I watched... Uh, the Anita Hill part, and it didn't sound right. So I went back and Googled because I remembered this. Yeah. And, and I'm, so I'm, do I'm, I. And I I'm very fond of, of Clarence Thomas. And I went back when the hearing was over by 58 to 26, the American people believed Justice Thomas and did not believe Anita Hill. And what I realized was what the left does, and then they're trying to do it with Charlottesville. They did it with communists in the government. What the left does is they take something and they decided that they were going to make Anita Hill a heroine. And so now we come to a point 30 years later where he can't even tell the truth. The truth is he said to Arlen Specter, and Arlen Specter wrote it in his memoir, he thought Anita Hill was lying. But Biden couldn't say that, not in stay in the race. Well, so, but the point is, yeah, but he has a whole history here. Oh, I mean, the, well, you, the, I don't know if you've seen the latest things. Which one? These things are so good. Which one? And I, I got to tell you three quick things if you let me. One, they just reported that he voted to make Robert E. Lee give him back his citizenship. Right. Well, if you think about how the left responds, oh, yeah. okay, there's a That's whole. That's funny. When that when that goes out across, it's going to be too good. He co-sponsored with Jesse Helms an amendment to stop busing. Oh, this was in the seventies. We've yes. we've gone back and researched yeah. all that. Uh, he was in one position, then he said, no, 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 we don't want to have forced integration. And his comments about reparations right. were pretty outrageous also. So here, here's the analogy I draw, and I, and I wrote a newsletter about this. Kate Smith did 3,000 recordings. Her most famous was God Bless America, which was written for her. She spent two decades visiting American troops around the world. Two of the recordings in 1931 had language that was racist one of which was actually sung by a black artist, but it's no longer appropriate. So they, they took down her statue from in front of the Flyers stadium. They have taken neither the Yankees nor the Flyers will use her voice anymore. They'll use a different version. And my point's simple. He's going to have so many Kate Smith moments in his career that by the time they get done with him, 
it's going to be just an embarrassment. I think by the time I get done with him, because uh, it's not going to be a lot of people. He will get a pass. Do you remember? I, I know we've talked about this a lot. It was Obama 07, 08. Yep. And I was driving, you know, Frank Marshall Davis and Alinsky and Acorn and uh, Reverend Wright and, and Bernadine Dorn and Ayers and, you know, what is a community organizer? And, the, you know, white folks greed runs a world in need. I had Obama on his own, reading his own book saying that. And all I was pointing out is his background showed a rigid, radical ideologue. Uh, what do you call it? Black liberation theology. He stayed in the pews of Reverend Wright 20 years. What did he hear in those pews? And we went over all of it. And for some reason, I think you thought I was do it was too much. I was going I, overboard. I have said over and over since then, you are the only person who actually understood the core radicalism of Obama. I mean, of all the people I dealt with that year, you were the only person. And you did it no matter the, everybody else ignored you and you didn't care. You kept coming back and coming back and coming back. Well, what have I been doing for two years on this whole fake, phony Russia collusion story? Right. Isn't, is there anyone else in the media, you know, except obviously talk radio, Rush, Mark, uh, Laura, Tucker, and, and Fox and Friends? Who else is there? Well, and I. Lou but, Dobbs. There and, you that, go. and that's why I think you have these two alternative realities. But the problem for Biden is the things that he did wrong are the things that drive the left crazy. I mean, if he did things wrong that drove you and me crazy, it wouldn't he could still be the nominee. He said Obama will. Wow, this is storybook, man. He's clean and art, art, articulate and and got the first uh, sort of mainstream African-American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice looking guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's a storybook. Articulate, bright and clean is, is African-American. That's a storybook, man. I'm like, what? Yeah. I, it's, I'm like, oh. But, but the thing you have to remember about Biden is he's he has a very pleasant personality, but not particularly deep in the brain behind it and so, so yeah you're saying all of the does it matter will it matter the record of obama biden for for eight years oh i think it's going to matter in part because of the Mueller report i think that it should matter i mean the first question that needs to be asked of joe biden is did you know any of this and if you didn't know what does that say about your role in the administration by the time we get to the bottom of all this it's right at the top yeah and there's no stopping what's coming. And people say to me, why can't we have it now? Because that's not the way the process works. But it's going to keep dry. You know, the other night you're, when you did the interview with the president, which I thought was pretty amazing, frankly. Uh, I think he loves doing it on the phone. I think he's sitting, his feet are up, and he's having oh, a good yeah, time. Oh, yeah, I know. No, I, I think <laughs> I, he, he is an unusual character. And he's an effective president, but he is an unusual character. Oh, my staff asked, well, how long is he going to be on? And I said, well, he could go the rest of the show or he could go five or ten minutes. It's up to That's him. That's right. That's exactly right. I have no idea. But, but he said something which drove the left crazy when he talked about this was an attempted coup. It was. Well, that's exactly what it was. I mean, we need to be honest about this. You had people in the United States so offended by the notion that Donald Trump could beat Hillary Clinton that there were bureaucrats in the U.S. government, methodic, including, I think, up to the president, methodically doing things designed to undermine the next president of the United States. Now, that is a coup by any reasonable standard. How does this play out for the election? And what do you, who's going to, if you had to pick the top front runners, is Biden probably has to be one. Do you look at Robert Francis, Beto? Do you look at Elizabeth Warren? Do you look at Bernie? Who do you like? Who do you think emerges? <laughs> I don't, I have, I don't. I mean, Look, to, to I answer thought, that question, you have to say, well, where are the Democrats? How crazy are they going to be? Well, I mean, I thought, I thought originally Kamala Harris had the best shot. Not anymore. Not anymore. I think that's right. But, but I, she was, she kind of fit where they are. Um, I th look, I think this is, this, you're going to think I'm crazy and, and I may be. Uh, but I, th I think better gig, if I said that right. But no, 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 uh, Buddha judge. Buddha judge. Yeah. I got to learn how to say this. Yeah. I think Buddha judge may have as good an opportunity as anybody. Really? From this standpoint, the two front runners are, are older people at a time when the Democratic Party's energy is younger. Uh, one of the two front runners is sort of vaguely a moderate at a time when the Democratic Party is moving hard to the left. 
The other one is nuts. I mean, I don't know if you saw it. You know, my theory of this whole thing is that they're going to become the 15% party. And if you look at it, the idea that you should allow violent criminals to vote while they're in prison. Including the Sarnav brothers. Yeah. Is, is a 15% issue. Okay. And you go to killing babies after they're born. That's a 15% issue. That's a 2% issue. No, no, it's about 15. Is it really? Yeah, yes, That's it is. That's scary. All right. It is scary. Mm. Then you get to... Uh, the, the New Green Deal. The New Green Deal, when you understand it, is like a 15% issue. Taking away your right to buy life, to buy insurance, is a 15% issue. I mean, you go down this whole list of things, and you suddenly begin to realize these people are running as fast as they can into a, into a blind canyon where they could So does Biden try and separate himself from that group or No, I mean if you watched him on, on on the view Friday what he what he did is he tried to appease everybody. Everybody. I mean, I mean Biden, Biden's natural instinct is to appease everybody and to, to be sort of a hug in fact one of the things he gets attacked for is he kind of a huggy bear. But but that but psychologically he is a huggy bear. Is there who who objectively in your mind you know re- politics you've this has been your sport and uh study for all these years and you're a historian who ha- has the best shot at beating trump mm-hmm. Buddha judge really yeah think about it mayor he Pete. does he doesn't exist he's That's... like he's like he, he is exactly like jimmy carter mm-hmm. card carter's great strength in 1976 was everybody could project onto him Whatever, Whatever they, they want. want. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. And you, you think that he's going to emerge from the pack? I think he could. Now, of course, they're then going to ask questions like, how come your city has not been prosperous? And how come you have all the problems with African-Americans in your city? I mean, this is a business where the higher you get, the hotter it gets. Uh, yeah, I think I've noticed in your <laughs> life and career. Um, and Buddha Judge, by the way, is going to he's coming to New York to meet with Al Sharpton. Apparently, they have a specific topic, according to ABC News, to discuss homophobia. Now, we have some... Now, everyone's kissing Sharpton's but, uh, ring. But, and, and but he's got to discuss reparation. How can he go see Sharpton and not make a pledge on reparations? But let's play the highlights of Sharpton so we know exact... I only have two minutes. All right, let me... Pl- These are the highlights of Sharpton, okay? okay? All right. I'm tired of the magazine. You ain't nothing. You're a punk f- Now, come on, do something. David, David. Yes. You want to be the only nigga on television? The only nigga in the newspaper? The only nigga can talk? Don't cover them. Don't talk to them. Because you got the only nigga on top. Uh, that's the guy they, they all look, want to support look, him? This is the Democratic Party. Yeah. Well, welcome to the modern Democratic right, Party. Quick break. More with Newt on the other side. His new book, by the way, it's up on Hannity.com. Uh, com. Collusion. He will be in Ridgewood, New Jersey, 6 p.m. tomorrow at bookends and on Hannity tonight, 9 Eastern. All right. The latest trend for dark web cyber criminals is now hacking into sensitive networks to steal the identities of children and then selling this personal data on the dark web. Now, a child's personal information can be very useful to a cyber criminal because children have clean credit histories, and that information can be used to make fraudulent purchases, loans, other transactions without the barriers that might be associated with data belonging to adults. Now, so many ways these cyber criminals can take what is yours, and when personal information is exposed, well, someone could use it to commit identity theft. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock detects a wide range of these threats, like your social security number on sale for sale on the dark web. Now, LifeLock uncovers the threats you would miss on your own, and you get 10% off your first year just by using the promo code Hannity when you call 1-800-LIFELOCK or go to LifeLock.com. That's 1-800-LIFELOCK, LifeLock.com, promo code Hannity. Protect your name, your finances, your reputation. Quick break, right back, we'll continue. is next you do not want to miss it and stay tuned for the final hour free for all on the sean hannity show tonight his book is called collusion and also be joining us tonight. all right uh, this is going to be fascinating to watch so everyone wants to kiss up to al sharpton we played the montage right. in the last break all right does that fly? I mean, look, look, that's okay because Sharpton in the end is going to mean reparations. Reparations in the end is insanity. 
It's not possible. Do you see any of these Green New Deal proposals being taken by the American people in this sense? Socialism, we're going to take care of everything. You don't have a worry, a fear in the world. We're going to take care of your health care, your school, your education, your this, retirement. This is going to be an, a race between a total fantasy that is obviously unsustainable and the hard work of creating a prosperous country. And you're going to have Trump representing hard work, and you're going to have whoever ends up as a Democratic nominee representing just a total fantasy. And it reminds me of two Real great cover. presidential reelections: Nixon over McGovern, Reagan, Reagan over Mondale. Yeah going to be great. Mr. Speaker, congrats on the book. Hannity.com, Amazon.com, bookstores everywhere. And uh, Ridgewood, New Jersey, bookends tomorrow night at 6. He'll be on with us tonight, 9 Eastern, on the Fox News Channel. When we come back, news roundup, uh, information overload hour. Wait till you hear. This is an unbelievable takedown of the left and the media by a liberal. Next, straight ahead.